Is death the end? Humankind has strived to answer this question since the birth of civilization. The major religions believe that after we die, part of us moves onwards. But some believe this journey can be halted, that a spirit or soul can become trapped between this world and the next, remaining with us as ghosts. The people you will see tonight have one thing in common. They all truly believe they have come face to face with ghosts. Ever since I've been a child, I've been able to see what we would loosely call ghosts or dead people. Machines blew up, lights banged. <laughs> I always felt I was being watched. I just lifted my head and said, F off. And it went. I was thinking, stupid cow, what's she doing out this time of night? Weather like this, you know, just with a dress on. It's quite hard to believe that a child is seeing something supernatural. I thought, why are my parents talking about these people that are here? It was almost as if I was being possessed. believed in ghosts. As a science teacher, she knew there was a rational explanation for everything. So why did she and her daughters flee into the night from their dream home, praying they would never have to step foot in it again? Julie and her engineer husband, George, married in 1986. They had two daughters, Francesca and Katrina. In 1994, they decided to move from their Walsall estate in the West Midlands. We decided that we'd sell the house and we'd make a new beginning in a rural part of the area. We thought that would be a better way to bring up our children. They found their dream home in a small village near Birmingham. Really just what we'd always wanted, it was the picture postcard cottage. The children loved it and we just knew it was what we wanted. We had our leg pulled quite a bit by friends who said, it's such an old cottage an 18th century cottage. Are you frightened about it being haunted? And we said, absolutely not. Julie now wishes she'd listened to her friends. The family had been in the cottage for two days when it started. A pocket full of posies. Tissue, a tissue. We all fall down. All fall down. Can't you just push me over on the stairs? Don't be silly, Cheska. She's been out here with me. And I was rather annoyed with Francesca because I felt that she was trying to get Katrina into trouble. Now, looking back, I wish I'd listened to her the very first time she said it. I thought it was my sister, but I read it. The force was too hard for her to have pushed me downstairs. It was like an adult-sized hand that pressed on my face as I went to go up the stairs. At the same time, there was a very cold breeze coming down the stairs. When I got to the top of the stairs, none of the windows were open. As a science teacher, I have to give logical reasons and answers to everything, and that's what I teach children to do. For the first time in my life ever, something was happening that I had no control over, and I didn't have an answer to it. Julie was having a hard time persuading her husband that anything was wrong. I wanted to believe what I was being told, but I am an engineer by trade, and unless I can see it or touch it, it doesn't exist. I was beginning to believe George and think, I must be imagining it. I can't explain it, so what's the other answer? George, what are you doing? You must be freezing out there. Come back to bed, love. What is it? A man! A man! Oh. 
Do you care that I've got to be working in two hours' time? Mo, there was this man in our room, and then he disappeared. He looked exactly like George. He got a really, really strange outfit on. It was cut in a style I'd never seen before. Over the next few months, the strange events got worse. There were terrible smells and unexplainable electrical problems. Wondering if she might find the answer in the history of the old cottage, Julie visited the local library. The village apparently was a real den of thieves. The stagecoaches were always being held up. There were lots of hideouts for highwaymen. It was really a very rough area. We found out that our cottage was linked up to the Welsh Harp pub by a series of tunnels. The tunnels were used from there for the highwaymen to escape down and actually escape through the trap door in our cellar out of our cottage. Close by there was a tree which was a hangman's tree. We don't know if the problems in the cottage were linked to a very vivid history or whether it was something else that was going on that we couldn't explain. But it was talking to the neighbours that produced the most chilling evidence. We found out that nobody had been in the cottage for more than 18 months. Arguments were increasing in the house um, due to the fact that I was being presented with all these stories. Julie started taking the girls to spend some nights at her mother's, but George was still unsympathetic. Nothing had happened to him, yet. The bang at the door was immense. The whole house shook. I ran to the door immediately and opened it, expecting to see somebody or something there. There was nothing there. George was about to experience firsthand what his family had been going through. Pictures coming off a wall were probably the scariest things for me. When I looked at the back of the picture, the cord was still intact and the hook was still in the wall. How had the pictures come off? I began to feel really guilty. These things had been going on all this time and I'd been ignoring them. Then things started to take a turn for the worst and we found that there was something going on a bit more than that and um, possibly some kind of poltergeist type activity. If the pennies did have a poltergeist, they became convinced its aim was to split the family and drive them from the house. It was as if they were playing me and George off against each other, playing the girls off against me. It was like somebody was causing downright mischief in the house. You were just like waiting for something else to happen. It, w it was like he was sitting on a time bomb. Unable to sell for the same price they'd paid, the Penny family were trapped in a home they believed to be possessed. Worse was to follow. I felt that it was becoming a personal vendetta against me alone at this point. I felt that it was trying to take me over and that I was actually going out of my mind. Julie found herself losing control. She felt as if she was being forced to do things against her will. as if I was reliving something that had happened in the past or something was trying to relive a life through me. It was almost as if I was being possessed. When George worked night shifts, Julie and the girls often slept in the same bed for safety, but nowhere was safe anymore.
I was quite tired and I thought it was my eyes just playing, but when I looked next to me, my mum had gone. So I thought, okay, I'm not dreaming, it's, my mum is like up there. So that's when I just started screaming. I wasn't going to put them through it anymore. I felt that we tried to fight it, we tried to have an answer to the questions we couldn't. We couldn't fight back anymore. Come on, girls, hurry up! We were just going to go. I felt as if it had won. It had beaten us. The pennies fled. It would be two years before things returned to normal when they moved to a quiet village in Scotland. Julie is teaching again, and the family have picked up life where they left off. Our new life in Scotland, well, it's just wonderful. And in some ways, that's been the only good thing that has come out of it. I don't think you should ever doubt your children. We tried doing at the start the thing of, oh, it's just a dream, oh, it's just a nightmare, oh, you know, it's just the wind. I don't think you should do that because you just never know just what's really going on. There have been no further problems reported in the cottage. In part two, a dark past returns the haunted Devon woman. It came back with such a vengeance, it was ten times worse. And does a tragic air crash hold the key to a modern day apparition? And I thought, well, if you're going to die like that, you know, are you going to stay around and haunt the place? St. George Hotel in Teesside. Built in the 1940s, its squat brick appearance gives it away as an ex-military building. Once it was the officer's mess of RAF Middleton St. George. When the Air Force moved out in the 1960s, the base became Teesside International Airport, and the mess became a hotel. The hotel is a busy stopover for air crew, but over the last 30 years, it's gained notoriety for being haunted. On the 17th of November 1982, airline pilot Barney Concannon headed for his room in the west wing of the hotel. I'd just come in from the late London flights, arriving about 9 o'clock at night. Another pilot, Grant Waters, was also staying in the west wing three years earlier in March of 79. I was sort of uh, working uh, earlies, so we had our normal sort of evening doing the bar. Both men were senior pilots, not given to flights of fancy. I went to bed slightly earlier than uh, the crews who were on dates. I went to bed about 11 o'clock. Uh, it was very cold, and it always was in that area of the uh, hotel. Got into bed, and I'd been in bed about two minutes, when I felt this heavy, really heavy pressure on my lower legs. and as if a man, or a heavy weight, was sitting on them. I felt the pressure on my legs, and eventually it sort of moved up to my chest. I felt the bed sort of going down with the weight. And I just lifted my head and turned it round and said, F off. And it went. And I said, please go away, because I'm on earnest. And he went just like that. Barney wrote an article about that night for Pilots magazine and discovered he wasn't alone. Interviewed 20, 25 people in working for British Midland who'd had similar or even worse, well, most of the experiences they had were worse than the one I had. Stewardess Heather Raybould stayed regularly at the St. George from 1975 to 1995. She claims to have been visited by the ghost twice. I mean, when I first joined British Men, everybody used to talk about this ghost. It's sort of like the weight of a, a man, really. Uh, it's a heavy weight of somebody pushing you down. I just didn't know what to do. I found I couldn't shout out, I couldn't talk, I couldn't scream. I couldn't do anything. I just felt like I'd frozen. I never wanted to stay in the hotel again. I did everything I could to change my posture. One stewardess was making her way down to breakfast. She was walking down the corridor and saw this pilot. 
said good morning to him. He didn't answer. She, she thought, oh, he's wearing funny clothes, you know, like the old palace she used to wear, the old leathers and that. And he, she turned around and he disappeared. He wasn't there. Could the clothing offer a clue to the ghost's identity? Barney started researching the history of the base. Somebody mentioned that a meteor had crashed into the building in the early 50s. And I did a bit of investigation into that. In a bizarre tragedy on the 24th of November 1951, Flight Lieutenant Raymond Norman lost control of his meteor jet while training. He slewed across the car park. Out of 30 cars there, he destroyed just one, a pre-war Humber, his own. Then he smashed into the mess, demolishing just one room, his own, in what is now the West Wing, where all the sightings have taken place. He was still alive. The accident didn't kill him at all. Uh, and as he was getting out, a lump of concrete fell down, struck him. The official cause of death was given as a broken neck. And I thought, well, <laughs> if you're going to die like that, you know, are you going to stay around and haunt the place? If it is the ghost of Raymond Norman, then he is still around to this day. He was seen in April of this year by a guest on a tour. Uh, the lady woke up in the middle of the night, uh, saw what she thought was a husband standing by the window and turned over to find that he was actually in bed with her. We like our ghost, he doesn't interfere with us uh, and we take, we take him as quite friendly. Unfortunately, he doesn't like flight crew and in particular flight deck and they're the ones that cause that he has the most problem with. Some of the cabin crew, um, if they're rostered to stay in the hotel, they used to go see it. I probably shouldn't be saying that, but, uh, but they did. Uh, whatever you think about this, uh, I mean, this has happened to 20, 25 people, to my knowledge. So there's got to be something to it. Fiona Hutchings and husband Viv live in a mobile home. Once they lived in a dream cottage, until their lives were turned upside down. Their story starts over a hundred years ago. One cold morning, the people of South Devon awoke to find a bizarre trail of hoof prints running across the county, made by a creature that was cloven hoof but walked on two legs. Convinced it must be the devil himself, a mob gave chase only to be beaten back by thick woods. It wouldn't be the last time the land was to hide a dark secret. Since then, rumors have abounded of strange goings-on in the woods and moors of the area. Tales of witchcraft, of devil worship, of black magic and human sacrifices. When I saw it, I, I thought, this is it. This is the house I'm going to live in forever. They're going to have to carry me out of here. After years of living in isolation on the Devon Moors, 36-year-old nurse Fiona Hutchings had just bought her dream home, Hawthorne Cottage. It seemed to be crying for help. It was very strange, very quiet. Built in 1914, Hawthorne Cottage sat among woods near the town of Tynmouth. Despite the financial burden, she'd made the move to be closer to her mother who had fallen ill. Fiona's son had recently left home, so she set about doing the place up on her own. From the start, she felt there was something strange about the atmosphere. After six months in the cottage, Fiona's mother died, leaving her completely alone. Then she met an elderly neighbour with disturbing news about the history of the cottage. She'd never passed my house because she'd been told by her mother not to. Because she said there's all sorts of funny goings on down there. And I said, oh, you know, bawdy things. And she said, oh no, she said naughty things. Really naughty. The old woman told her the previous owner of Hawthorne Cottage had gone mad. Fiona dismissed it as village gossip. But two months later, she made a gruesome discovery. I was clearing the outside because it was completely overgrown. 
and I started digging up these cats. They'd all been um, mutilated and then wrapped and placed in the north, south, east, west positions, which I thought was rather strange. The burying of sacrificed animals is a practice often associated with black magic rituals. Fiona had started to feel uneasy in the cottage, but digging up the cats seemed to trigger something unpleasant. felt like Hawthorne Cottage was turning against her. I'd have unexplained electrical faults. I got through about f three or four TVs. I had two fires that started for no reason whatsoever. Washing machine that wouldn't turn off. Microwave that blew up. Uh, five or six kettles. Fiona's sanity was being pushed to the limit. It reached breaking point one October night in 1989. I'd gone to sleep quite happily. Actually, I had some hot chocolate, which was one of my favourites when I couldn't sleep. And I woke up and I couldn't get out of the bed. I thought, how did these children get in here and what are they doing in the middle of the night? And I thought, they're not real and something terrible's happened. Six or seven months, night after night, I didn't sleep at all. I didn't know at the time whether it was me that was imagining it and I was going crackers or if they really were there. Finally, she could take the nightly visitations no more and called a friend, Louise Barlow, who was a medium. Usually, clients had to wait for several weeks to see me. But um, a little boy said okay. in, in me, you need to see this lady now, like today. that there had been black magic rituals or rituals of some sort where you get a group of people together uh, and they do as uh, they feel wonderful things but in fact it's awful whether it was that house I don't know but it was that land Louise felt that if Hawthorne Cottage was being haunted by events that happened on the land before it was built then it was essential to fight back she called in a qualified exorcist for the Liberal Catholic Church in nearby Exeter. The priest who still practices today has confirmed the events. Omnis spiritus imunde. He said the children had been sacrificed and he said it was a sort of ritual that I wouldn't wish to know about. Domine Jesu Christi. Every time he put holy water down, it was like when you throw water on a bonfire. The ash and blackness and the smell. That was appalling. Little by little, the smoke disappeared. I thought, it's finished, it's all done, it's, it's clean, it's lovely. And I slept for weeks after that. The nighttime visitation stopped and life returned to normal. Fiona married a merchant Navy electrician called Viv. When I heard about the, um, the sacrifices and things that were supposed to be going on down there, it does make you wonder whether you should believe it at first, whether it's hairy fairy stuff. A few months after the wedding, Viv went away to sea, leaving Fiona alone in the cottage. Despite him being away, she was happier than she had been in years.
The exorcism may have got rid of the children, but Fiona now believed there was something else in the cottage. It came back with such a vengeance, it was ten times worse. And when Viv returned from sea, he too found himself targeted, usually at night after he'd gone to bed. Oh, God! What in earth happened? I've got no idea how I got down there. Well, if I did fall down the stairs, I, got, I had no bruising or anything on me. I just can't explain that one at all. I went back to Louise. She said, this has come back since you got married. Not only have you freed the children, you, you're also happy yourself, and this isn't on, they won't have it. After more than a year of being terrorized, the couple were at their wit's end. They had heard rumors of an elusive local man by the name of John Parker. Ever since I've been a child, I've been able to see what we would loosely call ghosts or dead people. I don't look at myself as a medium. I'm just an ordinary bloke on a building site, laying bricks, making a living. But I have been blessed, if you like. What I was picking up from Fiona was pure fear. And I knew that there was very serious trouble in that house. Very serious trouble. At 7 p.m. on June the 6th, 1993, John Parker arrived at Hawthorne Cottage. In 30 years, he claims to have freed hundreds of trapped souls and has never charged a penny for his services. But this was to be his greatest battle. After five years of terrifying, unexplained phenomena at Hawthorne Cottage, Fiona and Viv Hutchings have called in ghost hunter John Parker. He is their last hope after previous attempts at exorcism failed. We'll soon have this sorted out. You must be Viv. Pleasure to meet you. Now sit down, both of you, and I'll explain all. John believes that ghosts are souls stuck between this world and the next. He has to persuade them to move on. It is a battle of mind, of strength, of belief. I have to be able to prove that I am stronger than what he is. I can hear footsteps running up the stairs. There's nobody there, of course. Not from this world. Right, you little brothers. And I from me. I knew that they were sacrificed for the cult that they belonged to. You don't be wrong, I'm telling you. The house shook, literally. Uh... I really don't think I've ever been so frightened, ever. I fought better than you, I'll tell you now. To actually hear it and experience it, it was nothing to warn you about that. I remember, boy. I'm going to be watching you. Passing all this way, you know him. You know where you should be, you've been hanging around here. Pass this one. Go on. Go on, I'm telling you, on your way. Nice, my dear. It had taken John six long hours, but the hauntings were over. He continues his work today in the southwest, but has experienced nothing like Hawthorne Cottage before or since. This is the worst I'd ever done. Fiona and Viv finally lost the cottage in 1995 to the banks. We now live from day to day. But one thing that I'm not anymore, I'm not frightened of things that I was frightened of, because now I've seen it, that's as bad as you can get. Twenty miles outside of Bristol is Chew Valley Lake. It's a tranquil place, but its waters hide a secret. At the bottom sit the ruins of the village of Morton, which disappeared in 1956 when the valley was flooded to make a reservoir. But does the lake also conceal the grave of a ghost? On June the 5th, 1999, Chris Pugh, with his girlfriend Wendy and his daughter Sam, were returning home from Bristol past the lake on the B3114. 
just as I got to the brow of a small hill, I could see a triangular light at the end of the cat's eyes. And just as I approached it, Wendy looked up and she said, Pewee, Pewee, look out. And I said, I know I've seen it. As it drew closer to this object, it's just a, a lady just appeared from the middle of the road and drifted very slowly in front of the car. My first thoughts were, oh, perhaps it's just somebody crossing the road. But then after I looked again, I realised that something wasn't quite right. I can remember distinctly that she had long, wavy hair that looked sort of greasy or even wet. I was convinced that it wasn't a human being, it was something supernatural. What is it? What could it be? And then the next thing you just think, crikey, that, that is a ghost. You, I just knew it. It wasn't until afterwards when I thought about it, I felt absolutely petrified. I, I didn't really know how, how to feel, how to handle it, I suppose. So I pulled into a small car park, into a pub just adjacent to the lake, and phoned the police, and that was quite a difficult explanation to give to them. Police searched the area but found nothing. A week later, Chris replied to an ad in the local paper asking for people who had seen strange things at the lake. A meeting at the local historical society was arranged for witnesses of the ghostly girl. There were about 12 people in total, which was amazing because all of them recorded almost the same information when asked a series of questions. Yet there was no collaboration because nobody knew each other before that night. One of those who saw her was Carol Gillen. I was thinking, stupid Carol, what's she doing out this time of night? Weather like this, you know, just with a dress on. Um, that was when I realised then that she was a ghost. The hair's on the back of your neck, so the knees turned to jelly and held onto the sort of steering wheel, like, like just very slowly watching her go up the lane. I started asking around the local village where I lived if there was anybody that knew of anything about maybe a girl out on the lake road. Um, and then I found a lady that had um, a book of sort of um, stories about neighbouring villages. I actually came across um, a passage in the book about a girl called Catherine Brand that lived at Stratford Mill, which now is Two Valley Lake. And the story goes that she'd actually drowned in the moat and she was only a young girl. So I just surmise that this is who it could have been. Catherine Brown disappeared one day at the turn of the century. The next morning she was found drowned. She'd been dead at least 24 hours. Yet her mother claimed to have seen her the previous night climbing the stairs soaking wet at a time when she was already dead. The events have left those that saw her wondering if it is Catherine Brown retracing her steps home, a home that now lies deep under the lake. From the dresses that she was wearing, you could see that she was obviously from the turn of the century, quite a while ago, and all the little jig pieces of the jigsaw started to fall into place. Any evidence of Catherine Brown's mortal remains disappeared when the waters flooded the valley. Somewhere there's got to be a grave. And I would love to think that she's here. Um, and I think until I've actually gone right to the end of the story, I won't be satisfied until I do. But I will find out. And hopefully it is Catherine Gray. Children often claim to have imaginary friends, make-believe playmates from their imaginations. But Susanna Hodson's invisible friends didn't want to play, and she was sure they were real. This wasn't a good thing, it was actually really quite evil. Susanna is now a 20-year-old university student. At the age of two, she moved with her family to a large Sussex manor house. From as early as she can remember, she claims to have seen people that nobody else could. Shortly after we moved there, she became quite disturbed at night. I mean, she'd have me up night after night after night for clearly no apparent reason. I'd always sleep with the light on the landing on and I just remember waking up in the middle of the night 
and feeling absolutely terrified. She would talk about a man called George who actually quite frightened her. For the next few years, the young Susanna continually claimed to see the man called George and a woman called Abby. Most children forget their imaginary friends by the time they start school. Come on, Susanna. Time for breakfast. But not Susanna. George and Abby kept me awake again. All night. You and your little friends. Do we should forget about them. Come on. It's quite hard to believe that a child of that age is seeing something supernatural. It's not something you think about. So you tend to assume that these are imaginary friends, perhaps, that she has. When I spoke about Abby and George, there was no um, recognition there. Oh, yeah, yeah, there was nothing, and that was quite confusing to me. Whoa! It was so real to me. Bye-bye, right, darling. You're going to be daddy's good little girl. George says that I'm a bad girl. Yes, well, George isn't real, so we can forget about what he says, hmm? Are you getting a little bit old for these play friends? I was, at that stage, finance director of one of the top hundred companies. I was bringing a lot of work home. I had a lot of problems, business problems, and the last thing I wanted was a domestic problem, too. But the problem wasn't about to go away. Susanna became more obsessed with George and Abby. I had some very strange situations with her where she wasn't herself in that she would come out with strange remarks. Mommy, it's Abby. Darling, this game's getting very boring. But she's right there! Make her go away! Look, there isn't anyone to make go away. You're just pathetic! I hate you! I hate you! I hate you! Yes! Susanna! I wanted Mummy to see her. The Abby I'd been talking about, and she didn't really know who she was. And that's quite disturbing for a mother. You just instinctively know that that's not your child talking. Then everything changed. Diana was to have an experience that finally convinced her that her daughter was telling the truth. Well, I do hope you've calmed down now, young lady. Donna? I would hear footsteps running and assume that it was her. Susanna! The odd thing was that the footsteps still kept on running. The strange events threatened to drive a wedge between Daniel and Diana. Darling, thank God you're back. It was difficult oh, in the beginning with him because he really didn't want to know, actually, at all. And didn't find it remotely interesting or believable. It's Susanna. Dan, I think I believe her. It's really scaring me. Diana, I really don't need this now. What you I know how it is. You get home, you're pretty knackered, uh, and immediately your wife starts in on some problem that she's had in the day. He just didn't find it credible. I don't know so what it was is. bashing my head against a brick wall, and he'd get fed up and cross. We'd have an argument. What are you trying to tell me? That this place is haunted? Darling, right now, I do not need to come home to a house full of hysterical women spouting about bloody ghosts. No, and I don't need you coming in at all hours of the night and not giving a damn about your family. Diana was getting more and more concerned, and I think she was frustrated with me because I wasn't actually giving her the right answers. But while her parents argued over whether she was imagining things, two floors up, Susanna had no doubts. trying to befriend me. They were just these entities that were in my life. They were just there. George had sort of shaggy brown hair and dark, exhausted looking face, sort of pasty. Not a nice face at all. And Abby, she had bags under her eyes and she had straggly black hair. I was so frightened and just curling up on the landing and just sleeping there. All night long, I couldn't even go down the stairs, which is a short staircase to my parents' room. Diana was now firmly fighting in her daughter's corner. I felt that it was bullying my young. And I would actually get quite angry. I would actually verbalise that sometimes <laughs> when I was alone and no one was listening. You've had your life. Why didn't you just bugger off? 
Go on, go to hell! You feel somewhat impotent because you don't really know quite what to do or understand how the whole situation is working. Unsure of where to turn, Diana contacted a medium in Portsmouth. She sent him something personal of Susanna's but gave him no details about what had happened. The response astounded her. He said there are presences in your house. There's a man who's actually quite evil. His name is George. And there's a woman called Abby. When he told me the names, George and Abby, it actually was very scary because it confirmed everything. The medium went on to describe a terrifying scene he claimed that happened at the house when George and Abby were alive. What he saw was a woman running in great fear, chased by a man. The woman's dress was torn at the back and the man was coming with an axe. No records exist of the pair, so no one will ever really know the truth, but it was enough to convince Diana. The only thing we could do was to actually have an exorcism, and I'd have to try to persuade my husband. So I said, look, you know, there is this problem. I don't really believe it, but if you can show me some kind of tangible proof, then we can take it to the next stage. It wasn't long before Daniel would be convinced. It was Susanna's eighth birthday, and her friends were invited to a party at the manor house. One of them was a young boy, also called Daniel. I went inside, um, I think I needed to go to the toilet. I'm not quite sure, but I remember going into the house on my own. An old lady, dressed in black. She was very authoritative. She did not want me to go past her. I just felt very uneasy, very scared. I just wanted to get out, get out as soon as possible. When we found uh, this little boy, Daniel, he was screaming his head off. He was standing there by himself and he was clearly very scared. Now I'm older, when I look back on it, it all seems very, very strange. I am convinced, though, that I saw a ghost. It was what Diana had been looking for. Someone other than Susanna seeing a ghost in the house. I began to realise we really did have something very difficult on our hands. And I certainly... I think anyone who has any belief in the metaphysical and any belief in an almighty uh, recognizes that there are things out there that you can't put your finger on. And I began to realize that this fell into that category and we had to do something about it. The Hodsons called in the church who eventually sent a minister to exercise the house. One very bright July day, but surreal it was, um, I came back from work um, at lunchtime and uh, the children were dispatched with the mother's help and Diana and I and, and this exorcist uh, went through the process. He didn't look like Max von Sydow. Um, it wasn't quite as dramatic as that, but it was very interesting. At the exact moment the exorcism ended, unprompted Susanna said something remarkable. George and Abby have gone to heaven. I don't know why I said it. It was just came from the feeling. And uh, I said, what's your batting average? Um, and he said, well, about 90%. I would definitely say that if we hadn't remained close as a family, that that entity, whatever it was, could have really done some damage. Susanna never saw George and Abby again. Perhaps they had only ever been a figment of young imaginations. It all worked so simply, and, it, and the, the exorcisms sort of unlocked everything and sent it away that maybe it was psychosomatic after all. But the story was not over yet. Two years later, the Hodsons moved to a new home. Soon after arriving, they invited their next-door neighbor, Marnie Jones, around for tea. No, you'd love it here. The village is beautiful, and don't worry about the locals. Well, I hope so. It's a wonderful place. It feels so at peace. Why? Wasn't your last place? Well, we had some problems at our last house. Where was it? We lived in West Broughton. West Broughton? God. I used to live there. That's amazing. 
for we lived in the manor house, you know, by the church. So did I. Oh my God. Did you ever, I mean, oh, I don't know how to put this, you'll think I'm completely barking mad, but, well, we had some problems there, mainly with Susanna, our eldest. Oh my God. You as well. I thought... I thought it was only us. In 1965, Marley was a five-year-old girl living in the same house as the Hudsons. She has nothing but terrifying memories of the place. I was too frightened to go and find anybody to tell them how scared I was. The feeling of being strangled you could actually feel the fingers coming around your throat. The name George had a very strong ring to it. I think that there were other entities there, but George is the only name that I have. As soon as your foot got on the top staircase, you had to fly. You had no fear about falling or slipping, because that was absolutely nothing compared to what was coming after you. The thing which really proves it was that uh, we bumped into someone in a million to one chance who'd actually lived in the house quite independently and had had problems with it. It still brings the hairs up on the back of your neck. There's no other way to describe it. It's a, it's a pure fear. And I would say it was evil. What was there was very evil. It still gives us nightmares, even to this day now, recurrent nightmares. And you know that that's a memory. But it really did happen that all those years ago. After terrorizing two families for over 20 years, the manor house is now calm. Perhaps thanks to the Hodgson's exorcism. It is currently a happy family home, and the owners have reported no evidence of haunting. If you believe the stories you have seen tonight, then you're not alone. Over half the population believe that the soul survives death, and a further third believe that ghosts are the evidence of a trapped soul. No one knows why ghosts appear at some places and why only certain people seem to see them. But they're more common than you might think. One in ten people in Britain claims to have seen a ghost, making this the most haunted place on Earth.